clearly, size alone does not determine results. Where and when did the small, rigorous high school concept originate? Neither small high schools nor a more rigorous curriculum is new to the world of high school reform. A push for greater academic rigor, especially in math and science, swept the country in the late 50s and the early 1960s in the wake of the Soviet Union's launch of the uh, satellite Sputnik. New math and science textbooks were written and bought. The advanced placement program was then launched. A quarter of a century after Sputnik, the report A Nation at Risk generated a similar wave of attention to academic rigor in high schools, inspiring more course requirements and tests for graduation to increase U.S. global competitiveness. Small high schools have an equally long history as an alternative for students and teachers. In the 1960s, small alternative schools flourished, but most did not survive the departure of their founders. In the 1980s, reformers attempted to establish such alternatives on a larger scale. Ted Sizer's coalition of essential schools helped create many places in which teachers and students, usually self-selected, formed a small school within a large high school. However, the idea of hundreds of small schools replacing large high schools is recent. The small schools movement that has already developed strong roots in big cities like New York, Philadelphia, and Chicago was greatly expanded by the clout of the Gates Foundation and other philanthropists who invested several billion dollars, that's billion, in redesigning high schools. Creating small, more rigorous high schools is aimed at beefing up the supply of college-ready graduates in urban communities. By replacing large urban high schools with small schools and by increasing the courses required for graduation, governors, philanthropists, and superintendents like Cleveland's Eugene Sanders hope ultimately to provide the college-educated workforce that American companies need. With many small high schools, what is supposed to happen with teachers and students? Creating small high schools is expected to overcome the alienation and poor education pervasive in so many large urban districts. With fewer students, teachers can get to know each one. 16-year-old George is much more likely to pay attention to a teacher who recognizes him and even knows something about his life outside of school than to a teacher who does not even know his name. In a small school community, teachers can work together to create a more demanding curriculum that is connected to the world and the lives of students. As a result, students will be motivated to work harder, learn more, and go to college. That's the theory behind small urban schools. There is a catch, however. Small high schools and more academic rigor do not necessarily go together. One can easily imagine a small school with a weak academic program and a large selective school with a strong one, such as the New York Stuyvesant School that I just mentioned. So if size alone does not determine results, does size matter at all? In some places and for some types of small schools, the answer is yes. Studies of Chicago small schools document some benefits including reduced rates of dropout and course failures in higher grades. Studies also suggest that small schools often provide more varied teaching strategies, a safer environment, and more teacher knowledge about individual students than large schools. But what about student achievement? Increases in test scores have been documented in a few studies, but these are not consistent across all types of small schools and tend to show up more in reading than in math. A recent evaluation of the Gates Foundation Small Schools Initiative found strengths in higher student attendance and positive learning climates, but noted a lack of rigor in curriculum and instruction. I'm quoting now uh, from that report. We concluded that the quality of student work in all of the schools we studied is alarmingly 
low, end quote. The benefits of small high schools are usually found in those that either operate independently as a, or as a school within a school, that is, those schools chosen by students and teachers. Parent and student choice is important. Moreover, the school within a school approach is effective only when implemented, according to the studies that I've seen, as an independent unit. Breaking up a large high school into small subunits known as conversion schools does not produce the same results and often replaces choice with coercion, particularly for teachers. What then does it take to establish rigorous and effective small high schools? New York City has become a laboratory to answer this very question. In 2003, the chancellor announced a plan to close over 20 large failing schools. To replace these closed schools, outside organizations were invited in to create new schools. By 2008, almost 200 non-selective small high schools were established by 18 nonprofit organizations, all with substantial support from the Gates Foundation. Over a few short years, high schools serving Thousands of students were replaced by brand new schools, each with a few hundred. Studies have yet to measure the impact of these schools, but their implementation suggests that, not surprisingly, they vary widely. Like charter school teachers, like charter schools, teachers in these brand new schools tend to be less experienced than their counterparts at larger ones. Student ratings based on a district survey were higher for the small schools, again, compared to the larger ones. There is evidence, of course, that large urban high schools do not work for the vast majority of students. And the common sense attraction of smaller, more personalized, safer schools is compelling. The challenge lies in creating schools in ways that achieve what parents, Policymakers, teachers, and students want. One small district has tried to meet that challenge. Mapleton, Colorado, just north of Denver, is an urban district with 5,000 mostly minority and poor students that until a few years ago had one high school, two middle schools, and eight elementaries. The board and superintendent launch, launched an effort in 2001 that married two popular reforms of increasing parent choice and creating small high schools out of one large one. They were successful in implementing seven small high schools, eliminating both middle schools, and creating a district where no neighborhood schools existed. And each parent had to choose the school that they wanted for their children from an actual menu of small schools. This fundamental reform altered completely the structure of schooling in Mapleton. In establishing small high schools and choices for parents, however, Mapleton leaders encountered many problems. They faced state sanctions for low academic achievement even after the small high schools were established. They got hit with budget cuts. Voters turned down two consecutive bond referenda, and they smacked up against those perennial dilemmas that accompany small high school reform. That is the story that I want to tell very briefly. Since the early 1980s, the Mapleton Public Schools struggle with declining test scores and graduation rates. By 2001, the district was one of the lowest performing in the state. In response, a new superintendent born, bred, and schooled in that community spearheaded the conversion of Mapleton's comprehensive high school, and eventually all the middle schools and elementary ones, into a network of small schools. The results of this complete transformation of a district, going from a caterpillar to a butterfly, are simultaneously surprising, hopeful, uneven, and in some instances, still uncertain. The circumstances in which the Mapleton reform occurred were favorable. The school board was unanimously committed to the districts to improving the district's performance. 